In order to be leaders of our lives, we, we must learn to lead from within so that what people see on the outside is a reflection of who we are on the inside. So there's consistency across the board in all facets of our life. Now, um, what we're really talking about is how to lead authentically, which you can't do if you don't know who your authentic self is. So, of course, you know, I've written, all my books have the word authenticity in it. I mean, I know authenticity inside and out, but you know where I really learned about it? Was on the golf course of all places. Who would have guessed? You know, it's like, it's like when you're not looking, there it is. And uh, so as this guy tell you a quick golf story, um, I've become a hacker golfer. Now, what a hacker is, somebody that doesn't practice, they just show up just to have fun, and they keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And the reason I, in fact, if you look up hacker in the dictionary, it says C. Greg Geeson. It does, it's weird, I don't know how that happened. The reason I've become a hacker is because I, I overthink the game of golf. I'm in my head too much, and it ruins everything. There's just too much stuff to remember. And I, and I just don't have a flow, and so I'm always thinking. And I'm one of those golfers that has the perfect practice swing. You know, it's like, I don't know what happens between the practice swing and the real, but tragedy happens. So, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, here we go. And, and then in my mind, I'm like, are the elbows bent or straight? Oh, oh shoot, what was it? And, and then I'm thinking about my knees, and then I'm thinking about my grip, and then I'm like, oh, I, I just hit the ball, and boom, 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 you know, over there. I'm like, crap, I hate this game. You know, and, and so I quit. I, I've quit about 30 times, right? So I'm, I'm playing with my brother-in-law, Dave, and this guy named Dan. And my brother-in-law, Dave, he does a lot of, um, what would I say, uh, uh, hit and run comments. You know, so, so I hit the ball, it goes way out to the right. He's like, you lifted your head, and he walks away. You know, hit and run comments. And, and this guy, Dan, it's like consoling me, like, and my ball's only like 200 feet over there. He's walking with me, which, you know, when you make a mistake, you don't really want someone following you. I'm like, what? And he's like coaching me as we're walking. Like, that's going to help. But really what it did was just create more stuff for me to think about. So what do I do? You know, I'm in this moment, and uh, so I decide, you know, that's it. I can't play golf. I think too much. And then... In the middle of winter, I have one of these magazines, and it's got this beautiful picture of Phoenix, Arizona, with these trees, this golf course, and it's golf school. And then I'm thinking, you know, maybe all the stuff I'm trying to remember, maybe it's the wrong stuff. Maybe I need new stuff or different stuff. And I've never actually gone to a golf school, so I decide to, by the way, these are not cheap. So I went to the golf school three days, you know, with like a, 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 a pro at like every 500 feet, you know, giving you, and of course you walk out of there with new clubs, new everything. I mean, talk about stuff. I had so much stuff by the end of that. But how many of you have ever taken a golf lesson? What typically happens to your golf game right after the lesson? Because they change so many things that it's awkward, right? And so a lot of times your game can go down. Well, in this three days, I had a few moments of glory, but my game got radically worse because they changed everything about it. And, and, and so I was, have, I was feeling guilty in the airport uh, in Phoenix. I mean, I'm like, that's it. I, went, I just dropped, I don't know, two, $3,000. And what do I get for it? My game's worse. I'm like, that's it. It's just not a good match. I'm done with golf. I don't ever want to see a golf ball again. So I'm sitting there, and, and in the bookstore, you know those bookstores in the airport? There's like a line of people around one book. And I'm like, it must be a good book, because there's a line of people. So, you know, I, so I just had a curiosity, because I thought I'd, I'd love a good novel just to get my mind off of golf forever. So, um, so I'm walking, and um, I can't tell yet what the book is, and, uh, but I'm curious. And then out of the corner of my eye, on the book cover, I see a little golf ball. I'm like, oh man, it's a golf book, you know? And then I'm, and so I'm walking away, and then I'm like, 
but there's a line of people looking. No, I'm not, you know, so I did one of those things. So when the crowd died down, out of curiosity, I went over to see the book. And this was the actual book. I bought it. The Legend of Beggar Vance. See, some of you are familiar. You've either read it, you've seen the movie. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a book about, um, it's a novel, which surprised me. I, you know, it's about a, a mystical caddy who comes into contact with this struggling golfer. And the caddy gives him all these profound hints about golf, which translate into his life. And all of a sudden, this golfer becomes a great golfer and a great person in life. He's applying the same principles. I think Will Smith played uh, Beggar Vance in the movie. So, I, you know, it's a novel. I don't know. Have you ever had a book just open to a page? No? Yes? This one did. Here's the page. I marked it. So I'm going to read to you what apparently I was supposed to read. This is uh, the caddy talking to the golfer. He says, I believe that each one of us possesses inside ourselves one true authentic swing that is ours alone. It is folly to try and teach us another or mold us to some ideal version of the perfect swing. Each person possesses only that one swing that they were born with that swing which existed within them before they ever picked up a club. He says, our task is simply to chip away all that is inauthentic, allowing our authentic swing to emerge in its purity. What do you, th what do you think he's saying? He's trying to be your authentic self. Yeah. And, and, and at that moment in the bookstore, I got chills because two things came to me right away. One was is that what I needed to do is discover my natural swing, which I had lost 20 years ago through every expert and friend that had advice on how I needed to tweak my swing. So it was so tweaked in 20 years that I don't even know whose swing it was, but it certainly wasn't mine. And that's why I could never remember anything. It was, it was a head game at that point. Too much to remember. I lost the essence of my swing that I was born with. And the second thing I realized is I was looking in the wrong place for the answers. I was looking out there for somebody to tell me how to play golf when I had the answers inside of me. And what I needed to do is get rid of all that advice and all that crap, break it down to what that core swing was, stick with it, maybe tweak it a little, but stay true to myself. And as I say that, you know I'm not just talking about golf, right? See, I believe that we all have what's called an authentic self and a functional self. The authentic self you know, is our dreams, our passions, our desires. It's the, the inner child, the innocence, the purpose, the possibilities. It's being comfortable in our own skin. But what happens is over the years, we learn that in order to be complete, in order to be accepted, in order to be successful, that we need more than that. We need a better body. We need a nicer house. We need a better looking spouse. We need a nicer car. We need more money, another degree. We need all these things in order to compete. And what's the real message there? Is that we need more stuff because we're not good enough as we are. So we have to keep adding more onto who we are in order to compete and be successful and be accepted. So what happens is we create this functional self, this uh, other side of us that has all those things, that strives for all those things. It's not who we are, it's who we think we need to be. It's based on image, safety, security. It's based on fear. It's based on control, self-interest. And most importantly, this functional self is based on meeting the expectations of others so that we fit inside everybody's expectations and we can then be seen as successful. And so we create this functional self to kind of deal with life. When I was in college, no, graduate school, I wrote this. 
I was a photographer and I thought this was the coolest statement in the world. Life is an illusion, create an image and it shall be yours. I'm like, that is so cool. I put it on everything. And now when I look at it, what I was doing was endorsing the functional self. I'm saying, don't be who you are, be who everybody else wants you to be and live in that world. It's the complete opposite of what I believe now. The more we buy into our functional self, the more we lose touch with our authentic self and then we no longer know who we are because who we are is what everybody else wanted us to be and that's, that's who we've become. And it's kind of hard to put words to that because where are you in there? It's really more about everybody else and so we lose ourselves. Um, some people don't even know who their authentic self is because their functional self is so successful. It works. It works, but then you get to a point in your life where you're like, I don't know who I am anymore because I've lived my life trying to please everybody else. I've done a great job at it. I got all these things. But if you were to ask me who I am, I'm, I have no idea. Somehow I lost myself in the process. And, and you can't do this kind of work from your functional self because you'll be doing just to do the right thing that everybody else is doing and you, that's not authentic whatsoever. Too many leadership programs, um, they add stuff on instead of take stuff on, you know, take stuff off. A new model, a new theory, a new 360, a new book, this and that. And you, it's like putting on another coat, another coat, another coat, another coat, and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'm the leader. Um, how am I leading today? I just have to see what we're supposed to be doing. You know, you've lost touch with yourself and you're so stuck that you don't even know. And the only way to really break through is to take off these coats which is what we do in leading from within. We try and get people to a raw point at the end where they're down to just themselves, naked if you will. And for some people that's a real struggle because they don't know who that person is in the mirror anymore. But the good news is it's them. 